open your Bibles. It's communion time today, so I don't have time to chit chat. Title of the message this morning, Holy Follow, Holy Victorious. Holy Follow, Holy Victorious. And that's not the Batman kind of holy. Like, holy follow, Batman. That's holy spelt W-H-O-L-L-Y, in case you can't see the wall behind me. Holy follow, holy victorious. The text is Joshua 14, from verse 6 to verse 14, but we're not starting there, but we will end up there. Today, we're talking about one of the greatest unsung heroes in the Bible. We love unsung heroes because for most of us, we can relate more to the unsung heroes. The lesson that we're gonna learn from our unsung hero today, listen, this is very important right up front. It might blow your mind that I would make a statement like this. The lesson that we are gonna learn from our unsung hero today is the most important lesson for a Christian to learn to be able to possess the promised life. This is it. That's a huge statement, let me repeat it. This unsung hero teaches us today the most important lesson for a Christian to inherit, to take possession of the promised life. I can't say it any clearer than that. Today we are gonna talk about the other half of the dynamic duo of Joshua and Caleb. We talk about Caleb today and give Caleb some great, great airtime because he's the one uh, that teaches us this most important lesson. He's the unsung hero of the Joshua and Caleb pair, uh, but he was right with Joshua the whole time, shoulder to shoulder, leaning in right there with Joshua the entire time. But Caleb did something that few in Israel did Caleb did something that few today do. Caleb chose one thing as just one thing. All right, no City Slickers fans in the first service either. Uh, (laughs) There's just one thing. Caleb chose one thing. He put one thing above everything else in this life. He put one thing above every desire. He put one thing above every desired accomplishment. Caleb chose to wholly follow the Lord. He chose to wholly and completely and exclusively and totally follow the Lord. And Caleb's choice, his determination to wholly follow the Lord, made him wholly victorious. Holy follow, holy victorious. And guys, if we will make the same determination to wholly follow the Lord, then the Lord will make us wholly victorious ultimately. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you reveal that to us, please? Would you make that come alive to us, Lord? That as we follow you wholly and completely and without reservation, Lord, that you, Lord, will respond to strengthen us and to make us wholly victorious. Lord, we pray that as Caleb's life comes to life to us today, that we would see ourselves there or that we would desire, in fact, commit to be in that same place, to wholly follow you and to allow you to make us wholly victorious. Lord, bring it to life for your glory and in your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. You know, God has not changed since the day of Joshua, right? God is exactly the same, and God today, just like God then, is still looking for men and women who will wholly follow the Lord so that he can strengthen them and ultimately make them holy victorious. On the wall behind me is maybe the most famous scripture to that end, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9 says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth, here it is, in order to strengthen those, in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. 
That's what we see in Caleb. The eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro to strengthen, to bring victory to those whose hearts are holy following him, whose hearts are fully committed to him. We'll see that in the life of Caleb, but in order to do it, we have to go back 45 years from Joshua 14. That's why we can't start in Joshua 14, because the story doesn't start there. The story starts in Numbers chapter 13. So turn to Numbers chapter 13. I really want you to make some marks in your Bible because this text in Numbers 13 and 14, though we can only survey it today, this text should rock you. And you should know it. And you should understand it. Especially if you are in any leadership position, either in your home, which is most important, or in the church our story begins on the edge of the promised land at the gateway of the promised land called Kadesh Barnea. Numbers 13 and 14 is where Moses sends not 12 spies, like you've often heard the story. He sends 12 leaders. He sends 12 leaders in to spy out the promised land and to bring back a report. It would have only taken Israel, the people of Israel, about a year to a year and a half to go from the Exodus in Egypt past, you know, to Mount Sinai, where they were there for 11 months and four days, uh, and, and, and then to move from Sinai to the edge of the promised land. So they're a year to a year and a half in right now. And when they get to the gateway, the edge of the promised land that God had already promised them, hence the name, Promised Land. We read in Numbers 13, verse 1, the Lord now said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. Send one leader, note the word, send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. Two of these 12 leaders were Joshua and Caleb. And these 12 leaders were tasked with recon. They are Delta Force. They, they go in early and they're, they're doing reconnaissance on both the land. Is it flowing with milk and honey, like God said? And they're doing reconnaissance on the enemy. What will it take for us to possess this land that God has already given us? The problem is, is that 10 of the 12 leaders instill absolute faithlessness in the people of God. Now, I know you thought I just switched to talking about the church today, and I did. Ten of the 12 leaders, instead of instilling faithfulness, instill faithlessness in the people of God. I am actually talking about Numbers 13. Look at Numbers 13, verse 27. This was there, the 10 faithless leaders. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. And then they actually show Moses a single cluster of grapes that takes two men to carry. But then in verse 28, they say, <laughs> but the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. It's hard there. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. <laughs> Those were the giants living in the land. Down in verse 3, they say, we fell like grasshoppers next to those giants. Yeah, these were leaders. The problem is, is that these 10 leaders were measuring the challenge of the promised land. They're measuring it to their own strength and their own ability. They measured the giants in the land according to themselves, just like the army of Israel would do again when they faced Goliath under King Saul. But as young David did, Caleb did here, Caleb measured the troubles and the battles and the giants, not against, against his own strength, but against the strength of God. 
not against his own power, but against the power of God. And so Caleb rise up, rises up and he tries to correct this faithless report from these other 10 leaders. In Numbers 13, verse 30, we read, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let us go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. Not because of our own strength, Caleb is saying, but because of God's promise. Caleb said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We can do this. God has already promised us. All we have to do is do it. All we have to do is go face to face with the enemy and God will go before us and he will certainly give us victory there. But it was too late. Listen, listen, it was too late because 10 leaders, 10 of God's leaders had instilled such faithlessness into the people of God that they were not able to recover. We blame the Israelites so often, but when we read the text, we go, wait a minute, it was actually the church leader's fault. They instilled the faithlessness. You know, that might be for you, it might not be. In Numbers 14, verse 1, here's the result of the faithlessness of the 10 leaders out of the 12. Numbers 14, 1, it says, the whole community whined and cried all night. If only we had died in Egypt. Why did God bring us out in the wilderness just for us to die here? We could have at least died in Egypt. And then in verse 4 of, of Numbers 14, the people said, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Now I am talking about the church culture today. We don't like what our leaders are saying. We want a new leader. Well, tell us what we want. I just gave you the core principle of building some churches. <laughs> then Joshua and Caleb again speak up as the only two faithful leaders in Israel. Numbers 14, verse 6. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. Verse 7, they said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And mark this, if the Lord, verse 8, if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into the land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us victory. If we will wholly follow the Lord, we will be wholly victorious. That's what the only two faithful leaders said. And then continuing in Numbers 14, verse 9, Caleb pleads with the people, do not rebel against the Lord. How are the people rebelling against the Lord? By their unbelief. Do not rebel against the Lord. And don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless. Pray to us. If you're reading one of the literals, it says they are bread to us. And you think, what does that mean? It means we're going to eat them alive. <laughs> ah, that's good. <laughs> we are going to eat them alive. They're only helpless. Pray to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the story, the illustrations in Joshua are meant to illustrate our spiritual battle in a Christian life and following Jesus. And Caleb saying, don't wimp out and don't rebel against the Lord in your unbelief. He will make that enemy pray for you and you will walk all over him. And so in verse 10, just as in churches today, the people start talking about stoning Joshua and Caleb, right? All right, this is definitely not what we want to hear, so we're going to have to kill you. Okay, I've seen it happen. Not physically, but spiritually. So the people decide they're going to stone Joshua and Caleb. <laughs> and then the Lord gets involved. We love it when the Lord gets involved. 
Okay, in verses 11 and 12, let me just paraphrase it for you. In verses 11 and 12, the Lord says to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt and unbelief? Let me do this, Moses. Let me wipe them all out with a plague, and you and I will start over. You think that sounds like something God would say? It's right there in verse 12. Moses, I'm just going to wipe them all out, all right? I'm tired of this. What's God tired of? Unbelief. Lack of faith. He said, I'm just going to wipe them out with a plague, Mo. We're going to start over. And of course, God's not going to do that. We understand the unilateral covenant. But God makes a commitment to said, Moses intercedes because Moses is the intercessor. He's the mediator, a type of Christ. And so Moses does his job. He intercedes. And God says, OK, tell you what I'm going to do. I won't wipe them all out. But the entire generation from 20 years old and older, that entire generation will never see the promised life. Never. They will wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they die. The consequence of unbelief in the Old Testament is the same as the consequence of unbelief in the New Testament. The consequence is death. Was then just as it is now. But look at what God says about Caleb. Caleb's our focus today. Caleb's our hero, our unsung hero today. Look at Numbers 14, verse 24. God says, but my servant Caleb has a different attitude than the others have. Whoa, wait a minute. Are you telling me God cares about my attitude? Duh. Caleb has a different attitude than all those others who are gonna drop dead in the wilderness. He has remained loyal to me. Paraphrase, he has wholly followed me, so I will bring him into the land he explored. His descendants will possess their full share, not partial, their full share of that land. And guess what? The tribe of Judah under the leadership of Caleb was the only tribe that fully possessed the land that was given to them in the promised land, the only one. Because Caleb was not going to stop until he received the whole victory that God gave him from him wholly following him. Right there in Numbers 14, you're in Numbers 14, right in your margin, right there by verse 24, write Numbers 32, 11 and 12. That's a cross-reference for you. Numbers 32, 11 and 12. I'll put it on the wall for you. It says there, Numbers 32, 11, of all those I rescued from Egypt, God speaking, no one who is 20 years old or older will ever see the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why, God? For they have not obeyed me wholeheartedly. (laughs) What? But we had a crusade. There was a million Jews in the desert, and they all slipped up their finger and repeated the prayer, God. I'm not, I'm not being cynical. I am being cynical, but I didn't mean it to be that clear. Why, God? Because they have not obeyed me wholeheartedly. Because they've not followed me wholly and completely. Verse 12, the only exceptions are Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, son of Nun. Why are they exceptions? For they have wholly followed the Lord. They have wholeheartedly followed the Lord. Remember, I have to go back and preface this because I just made those little comments. Joshua is not about salvation. Joshua is about living the promised life in Christ. Salvation is by faith alone. But if you want to live the promised life in Christ, you got to follow Jesus. So I'm not making a decision about who's saved and who's not. I'm saying that the Bible clearly teaches us that if we want to walk in victory with Christ, that we have to actually follow him, right? Yeah. All right. I know you guys know that. But I had to clarify that so someone doesn't freak out on me again. Uh, look, look back at Numbers 14, 24. Caleb had an entirely different attitude. Do you see it? Caleb had an entirely different attitude. Here's what it was, just to make a little tangent teaching. Everyone else in Israel wanted God to give them what they wanted. Caleb said, I will follow you no matter what. I will wholly follow you 
all the way. That's his different attitude. He was wholly following the Lord, and so the Lord promises because of that that he would make Caleb wholly victorious, and Caleb would take full possession of the promised life that you and I seek. Caleb will take full possession of the promised life that you and I seek because he is committed to wholly following the Lord. Are you seeing the point? That's good, isn't it? Isn't that good? Don't we want to just say, man, Caleb won. He did it. He did it. He made his commitment to wholly follow the Lord, and the Lord made a promise that he would be wholly victorious. So what's next for Caleb? What happens next? Well, I'll tell you what happens next. He wanders around in the wilderness with all the unbelievers and suffers every trial and every tribulation that all the unbelievers suffered. That's what happens next. For 40 years, he suffers under the same trials and tribulations that the unbelievers did. <laughs> That's not fair, God. Side note, don't tell God what's fair. I'll just throw it out there, <laughs> okay? Just, you know, just don't. Caleb got this phenomenal promise from God because of his commitment to wholly follow the Lord, and then he spent 40 years suffering under the same trials and tribulations as all the unbelievers. Is there a lesson in there for you? Is there a chance that we've been duped by, by uh, let's say, uh, well, let's just say heresy, for example, that, that if we make a commitment or slip up our finger or repeat some words, that God will fix everything in this life for us? Have we maybe been sold a bill of goods? That Jesus Christ came down from heaven and took on your sin and the sin of the world and died on the cross under the full wrath of God so that you could get a better job? So that you could get a better spouse? so that you could have more money or a bigger lawn or whatever, another llama? I mean, what? <laughs> Listen, please. In Christ, we have the most incredible, the most indescribable, the most awesome and internal, e eternal inheritance. We can't even grasp it. Paul says in Romans 8, 18, it's not worthy to be compared with any suffering in this present life. You can't even grasp what God has given you. You can't begin to. 1 Peter chapter 1 from 3 to 7 says we've been born again by the grace of God, and we have an inheritance that is undefiled and will not fade away, and it's reserved in heaven while we are being kept by the power of God here, and one day our full, full inheritance in our salvation will be revealed to us someday, someday, someday. I'm sorry if you've been misled on this. It's generally because somebody wants to fill a seat and get a check. The truth is, is that Jesus Christ said in John 16, verse 33, I have told you this so that you may have peace in me. That's his desire, is that we would have shalom in Hebrew, irene, peace. It's, it's everything in place. You would have peace, not in your circumstances, not in your situation, not in the stuff of this world, in me, in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that you would have peace in me. And then he says, here on earth, you will have peace many trials and sorrows. How in the world does the word faith people deal with that? You know, they just say, you know, by faith, that's not in the Bible. No, it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be so like that. All right. I deserve it if I get a bad email on that one. So, here on earth, you will have trials and sorrows. But take heart, I, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Please notice, I'm not on a tangent, by the way. This was planned. So if you plan it, it's not a tangent. Jesus doesn't say, I will fix all your stuff. 
Jesus doesn't say, I will make everything in this vapor of a life just how you want it. I'm like Robin Williams in the movie Aladdin, the big blue genie. You just tell me and I'll give it to you. He says, you're going to have trouble in this life. Why? Because you live in a fallen world where there's a little G gone who's in charge. But in Christ, We've overcome this world. In Christ, our victory is full and complete, and it's set. We wholly follow Jesus now. He makes us wholly victorious later. Later, later, later. And that gives you so much peace. It gives you so much peace. Caleb is a perfect example of this. Did God make a way for Caleb to inherit all that he promised? Has God made a way for you to inherit all that he's promised you? Is it now? Was it now for Caleb? 40 years, this poor guy had to wander around with a million whining babies waiting for them all to drop dead so that he could receive his promise from God. Read it. That's what it says. God's made a way. God has made a way for you to inherit all of his promise, and that way has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ, and all of your inheritance is in Christ. All of your victory is in Christ. All of your eternity is in Christ. It's not in the stuff of this world. It's in Christ. And that's the way it was for Caleb for 40 years in the wilderness Man, so do you think Caleb gave up his faith during his 40 years of being under the trials of under the same trials as the unbelievers? Do you think he wavered in his faith? Do you think he stopped wholly following the Lord when he got so sick of manna burgers he couldn't have another one? Listen, I just had some banana pancakes right there, right between, between services, man. I love, I love how they're feeding the kids because it gets me through the second service. Uh, if you, Caleb is living like those who are under the curse of God for 40 years. But the whole time, God had promised him whole victory, complete victory. So please, don't ask God for a shortcut. Don't make him your genie. Meet him. Here's the secret. Can I tell you the secret? Please hear me. Meet the Lord in the midst of whatever you're in the midst of, right where you're at. Seek Christ. Holy follow him. Know him more right where you're at because what God wants to do is he wants to reveal himself to you while you're on the way to ultimate victory. God wants to meet you where you're at. He wants to carry you through where you're at. He wants you to know him better where you're at until you receive the inheritance that's reserved for you. Amen? Amen. All right, so do that. That's what Caleb did. So we skip ahead 45 years. I just shared 45 years of Caleb's life with you. After 40 years in the wilderness and five years of battle in the promised land, we meet Caleb again in Joshua chapter 14. So now you can get to Joshua 14 verse 6. I I want you to do something as I read a long text from verse 6 to verse 14. I want you to do something for me, okay? I want you to look to see if anything changed in Caleb's life. 40 years of living through the same trials and tribulations as unbelievers in the desert, 40 years of barely getting by on manna, 40 years of waiting for God and five years of battle, you look for a place to see if Caleb changed at all. Joshua 14, verse 6, a delegation from the tribe of Judah, led by Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, came to Joshua at Gilgal. Caleb said to Joshua, bro, remember what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, about you and me? When we were at Kadesh Barnea, when we were at the gateway, I was 40 years old. When Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan, 
I returned and gave an honest report. But my brothers, my fellow leaders, verse 8, who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. If you're a leader in your home or in the church, be afraid. Because 10 leaders took out a million people in unbelief in this story. My brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, the end of verse 8 says, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. That was 40 years ago. So that day, Moses solemnly promised me, the land of Canaan on which you were just walking will be your grant of land and that of your descendants forever. Why? Because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. Skip ahead 45 years, verse 10 now Caleb says as you can see the Lord has kept me alive and well as he promised all these 45 years since Moses made this promise even while Israel wandered in the wilderness do you see what he's saying there He's saying, now I stand here today alive and well because of God, even though I've gone through 45 years of the same trials and tribulations as all the unbelievers, I stand here with you today. The end of verse 10, he says, today I am 85 years old. Here comes the point, verse 11, I am as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on that journey, the, the spy journey, and I can travel and fight as well as I could then. Remember, the physical battles in Joshua, the physical battles in Joshua are meant to illustrate the spiritual battles in our life. And so if we take this picture into the spiritual war, we say, Caleb is saying, listen, I've been at this for 45 years. And I have the same strength I have and I have the same determination I have today as I had 45 years ago. Verse 12, so give me the hill country. That was the hardest section, the hardest land in Canaan. Give me the hill country that the Lord promised me. You will remember that as scouts, meaning as spies, we found the descendants of Anak living there in great walled towns. Those are the, the giants in the land. These were the giants in the land living in great walled cities. And Caleb says, give me that land. Give me the hardest place in the land. Continuing, he says, but if the Lord is with me, do you remember him saying the same thing 45 years ago? 45 years ago, he told the people, if the Lord is with us, surely he will drive out the enemy. 45 years later, Caleb says, if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land just as the Lord said. Oh, man. Listen, what's so incredible here is that the passing of 45 years of battle for Caleb hasn't changed a thing. Not one thing. 45 years later, his faith, his strength, and his obedience were just as strong as they were the day he started. Moreover, he says, I know that God is the same. Just as God would have driven the enemy out for me 45 years ago, he will drive the enemy out for me today. As I have wholly followed the Lord, I know that he will make me wholly victorious. And so again in verse 12, Caleb says, give me the hard land. Give me the hard country. Give me the craggy mountain, rocky area where the giants of Anak live in the great walled cities because I want to experience God's victory today as much as I wanted to experience it 45 years ago. I wanted that victory from the Lord 45 years ago and I want it just as bad today, so send me in. I love this guy. Caleb saying, this is it. This is it. 45 years of trials with all those numbskulls in the desert. This is it. I get to take the promise that God has promised me. He's thrilled that it's only been 45 years. We're like, Lord, I've been asking you this for four weeks. 
and I highly expect you, by faith, to do what I've told you to do. Caleb says, Lord, I've wholly followed you every day, in every circumstance, in every situation. I haven't turned to the right or to the left, and you are gonna bring to pass the victory you promised me 45 years ago. Praise the Lord. What is it? What is it? What's the victory for Caleb? What is it that he's so determined to inherit? It's in Joshua 14, verse 13. So Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave Hebron, underline it, gave Hebron to him as his portion of land, as his inheritance. Listen to me, please. This is so important. I, I, can't, I can't overstate this. Caleb's ultimate inheritance, Caleb's ultimate goal was to gain Hebron. Caleb's ultimate inheritance was to gain Hebron. When Caleb went into the promised land 45 years ago to spy it out, there was one place he saw, and he said, that's my place. That's where I need to be. It was Hebron. The place was Hebron. Hebron's located on the top of a mountain ridge. It still is today, and it's uh, maybe, I think it may be rougher today than it was then. We certainly, uh, as Christians, can't go there uh, today um, unless you join the IDF and, and uh, the, <laughs> you can go with them, but uh, we can't go there. Um, but he, Hebron is at the top of this rocky, craggy mountain range. Hebron was a stronghold to the descendants of Anak, the giants, great walled cities. And all he, Caleb could think about was, give me Hebron. I want Hebron. That's what I want. Why? Why? Why, Caleb? Why is it so important to you that your inheritance is Hebron? Why not ask, Caleb, you're the star of the faith. Why not ask for the lush, green, pasture lands of the Jordan Valley where stuff grows without trying and you can graze your animals and get rich quick? Why, Why not ask for a part of the land where there is no enemy or at least a small enemy? Why have you set your eyes on Hebron? Why what is so important about Hebron? I'll tell you, since you're asking. Hebron is the place that Abraham made his most permanent home. He didn't have a real permanent home, but his most permanent home was in Hebron. Hebron is where God again promised Abraham that he would give him both the land and make him a great nation. And here's the big one. Listen carefully to me, please. Hebron is where God came down from heaven and met face to face with Abraham. Hebron is the place that God made it possible to meet with man face to face, to meet man there and to commune with man there, to have true fellowship with man and even to become a friend of man. The word Hebron means to keep company with, to be associated with, those are the literal definitions, that it has the sense of fellowship, the word does, of communion and of friendship. Hebron, as the word, has a sense of fellowship and communion and friendship. In Arabic, they call Hebron Khalil, and maybe you uh, will see that if you uh, watch Al Jazeera TV. Uh, Khalil in Arabic, it means friend, as in friend of God. And Caleb says, all I want is Hebron. After 45 years of following the Lord, Caleb's ultimate victory was gaining the place of true fellowship. Caleb's ultimate victory was gaining the place of genuine communion. And Caleb's inheritance, his ultimate inheritance, was gaining the place of friendship with God, Hebron. That's why he wanted Hebron, because of the history of Hebron and Abraham and God coming to earth and meeting with Abraham face to face as a friend. Caleb, you want lush, easy land in this world where you can grow crops and have cattle? No, forget it. Caleb, you want a place where there's no enemy? It's really simple to live? Forget it. 
I want Hebron because I know at Hebron there's true fellowship and genuine communion and friendship with God. Nothing else in this world matters. Give me Hebron. Hebron is a picture, it's a type of the place that God ultimately made it possible to come from heaven and meet face to face with man, where God made it ultimately possible to have true fellowship with man, to have genuine communion with man and to become a friend of man. Hebron in the Old Testament is a picture of Calvary. It's a picture of Calvary where God met man as a man. It's a place where God ultimately enabled us to have true fellowship with him, to have genuine communion with him, and to call him friend. Caleb knew that he had to inherit the genuine communion with God, the place of genuine communion with God. And Caleb was willing to wholly follow the Lord through thick and thin, mostly thin, for 45 years in order to gain this place of fellowship and communion with God. And he gave up everything in this world, you might say, the easy side of the world, the profitable side of the world, the non-battle side of the world. And he said, at any cost, I need need this place of communion and fellowship with God. That is my victory. Guys, please hear me. Please, please hear me. As Caleb set his sights on Hebron, we must set our sights on Calvary. As Caleb wholly followed the Lord to gain the ultimate victory of fellowship and communion and friendship with God, we must set our sights on the same goal, the same inheritance, and it comes through Calvary. It's not, it's not what God can do for us, it's who God is to us. It's not the circumstances, it's the relationship. Because Caleb knew that was the source of his faith and the source of his strength and the source of his his peace, a source of his life. And he knew better than to seek after the stuff that would not bring that, the stuff of the world. We must wholly follow the Lord to become wholly victorious. And that ultimate victory Please hear me. That ultimate victory has nothing to do with this world. That's the truth. That ultimate victory is not getting that car that's on your refrigerator right now. Take that down and burn it. The ultimate victory is Christ himself. The ultimate victory is Jesus Christ himself in him. In him is all that God has given us. In him is our ultimate and eternal victory and all of our inheritance and all of our promises. They're all caught up in Christ. Why are we seeking something better in a life that could be gone tomorrow? We'll finish today in Joshua 14, verse 14. This is my prayer for you. Listen, I've had a unique couple of weeks where I've experienced multiple times, including personally, the brevity of this life. The absolute ridiculousness if I can use that word, of seeking after the things in this life. Jesus says, what is it profit? A man, if he gains the whole world and loses his soul, we have got to set our eyes past the horizon. 
Joshua 14, verse 14. Here it is. Hebron still belongs to the descendants of Caleb. What is Hebron a picture of? Say it. If you remember it, please, please remember it. Calvary. Calvary still belongs to the descendants of Dave. That's it. That's it. What is the ultimate victory in this place? It's that our descendants will own Calvary. You want to give them money? Are you kidding? All it does is cause them to fight each other and get all angry and hate each other and not talk to each other for years. Give them Calvary, man. Let them know Christ. Hebron still belongs to the descendants of Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite. Why? Because he wholeheartedly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Tell me when you leave this place, what will they say of you? Will they say he still owned Calvary? Calvary still belonged to him or to her and to their descendants. Will they be able to say that Calvary was your ultimate victory and that you wholly followed the Lord to become wholly victorious in Calvary and then to ensure that your descendants would do the same? Will they say he wholly followed the Lord and he is now wholly victorious? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, give us revelation, insight. Lord, we can't see there's too much stuff in our way, the stuff of the world and the flesh and our own understanding and our pride and our lust of the flesh. Lord, God, wipe it all away and help us to see that our ultimate victory is in you, Jesus is in true fellowship with you, is in genuine communion with you, and is in friendship with you, Lord. That is our victory because that is our eternal inheritance, Lord. And so, God, whatever we're in today, may we meet you in it. May we wholly follow you in it. And may we know that our victory is set in you, Jesus. And, Lord, our role is to wholly follow you and allow you to make us wholly victorious. Lord, as we prepare our hearts for communion, we pray that you would pierce us, that we would know where we stand and that we would wrestle with you during this time and that we would truly decide right now whether we want your life to replace ours, whether we want, Lord, to consume you, to have you replace our lives with yours, Lord. God, draw us to that place now. 